Excuse me. We can choose one or the other as we like. Well, uh, first the announcement I thought I just wrote. So tomorrow and on Thursdays they will be given guidance. As we agreed on last week, I asked you and you told me that the majority of you, for the majority of you this time on Wednesday morning is okay. So from 8 to 10 in the room where we also had the first lesson yesterday evening, R54. And we have for those who cannot come to that occasion and others who also want to have another uh, more guidance, you're welcome then on Thursday evening from 18 to 20 also in that room. So you can choose if you want to go there to one or two or to neither, it's up to you. You're welcome. And during the first lesson, not the first lesson, but the lesson tomorrow morning, first lesson was yesterday evening, so the lesson tomorrow morning uh, and also the coming Wednesdays, also Jürgen, the scientific assistant, Jürgen Bornes, will be present and me to give you guidance. And on this occasion only me will be present. Because we do not expect so many people to come there, but I think most of you will probably come tomorrow morning. Are there questions regarding the lessons? Well, uh, regarding uh, the, we have this information regarding the lessons also here. Now it's also beginning. I had a typos which I was, uh, which were pointed out by one of you. Thanks for that again. Now it's correct, I hope. And there is a new uh, notice regarding MATLAB. I assume that you are all very familiar with MATLAB, especially those who have taken the introduction to CFD, the course last term. You had a lot of training in MATLAB. For those uh, who don't have this training, I gave uh, two references, one short one by a former colleague of mine, Richard Waite from Oxford University, and a more extensive one uh, also given, and you find many more MATLAB primers in literature. What is useful for anybody of you using MATLAB is to use the help, MATLAB's own help facility. Here I just gave you some hint for getting started, but if you have any question on MATLAB, just go in help and, and look for that, what you're looking for. And you can do that under product help. If you know already what you're looking for, uh, let's say the LU decomposition or whatever, you can write, type in the MATLAB window DOC doc, and then the function that you want to know, or plot, doc plot, for example, and you get it directly. So there are many ways to get uh, information, and, uh, but uh, if you don't have MATLAB um, training at all, then uh, I expect you to work very hard, uh, especially in the beginning, to get uh, the exercises, the first seven exercises in MATLAB done. But you have still a chance to do that and to get um, feedback and to get guidance during the lessons on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Okay, if there are no questions on the organization, we can continue with the lecture. What we have seen before the break was the derivation, the general derivation of the finite volume method. And let's see, I think I have it here already for the special case. Let's see. I think I have it already for the special case for the special case that we want to derive now. And the special case that we want to look up now is that we want to assume alpha to be constant, so that we don't need to discuss the alpha d e and the uh, a plus one half and so on. So the alpha is the ther thermal inclusivity. And more importantly, we assume that we have an equidistant group. And that means um, that we assume that the delta x um, j, which is the uh, x uh, j plus one half minus the x j minus one half, so that's the length of the cell j, but that is simply constant. That, that is uh, also uh, it's also equal then to the um, the distance from one midpoint to the next, that is from j plus one minus x j, and that that is uh, delta x that is constant. That is the assumption that we have. 
equidistant, so the, uh, the same distance for each control volume and also the distance between each uh, consecutive midpoint. So then the right hand side that we just discussed in the equation that we derived uh, for the finite volume method. So uh, simplify the R expressions for R simplify. And uh, we note that there is a little catch with it. When we have an equidistant grid, then we note that the x1 minus the xa is similar to the xb minus the xnj. They are actually delta x half. <coughs> because uh, the midpoint is halfway in the last or in the first cell. And the distance to the next uh, to the boundary is only delta x half. So that is the difference. In the interior, the distance between the midpoints is always delta x, but at the boundaries we have only delta x half. So that is uh, we know that here. But what we uh, what we get if we, if we do this simplification then is that we get the R1. And the delta x, they are the same then. Or, so we can get them the delta x squared in front. We get the t2 minus, usually we would get the minus 2 t1. Now we get 3 t1 because of this here. And we get the 2 t8. And the t that is in the interior, Rj, that is the normal one, we get alpha divided by delta x squared, and we get Tj plus 1 minus Tj, and then minus Tj minus Tj uh, minus 1, and that gives them here at minus 2 Tj and the plus Tj minus 1. And that is true then for j from 2 to n j minus 1. And the r n j, the last, the right hand side for the last cell, that is then the following. We have there again the difference because the boundary condition will come to be. And due to this delta x half, we have to divide by that. We get a 2 times Tb minus Tnj. So that is then making a difference again. So we get here again the alpha delta x squared. But here we get a difference. Here it turns out to be 2 times Tb minus 3 times Tnj plus the Tnj uh, minus 1. So that is then, those are then the expressions for an equidistant grid and a constant thermodiffusivity. So you just go into the equation that we derived and you use this special condition that we have an equidistant grid and that alpha is constant and we get that. So, if we look at that, and we remember the course on discretization by the finite difference method, then it is very clear to us that 10b is exactly the same as we derived with the finite difference method. It's exactly the same. So that means for the interior cells, we get exactly the same discretization by the finite volume method for an equidistant degree as for the finite difference method. If we had chosen our control volumes in a similar way also as the finite difference method, which we did not use here at the boundary, we will use that later in the course, then we would get exactly the finite difference method. But here we see a difference. The difference is coming from the fact that we have near the boundaries, if we just look at the left boundary as an example, 
have here with x1 is the x2. Uh, here we have the temperature. Assume we have here the Ta. And here we have the T1. Here we have the T2. Here we have a difference, a distance of delta x between those. That is as usual for any point. So there, there is no difference. But for the left, this distance here, that is delta x half. And that makes the difference. So therefore we get the different formula for the first and the last cells. So that the last cell is similar to the right. Yes? You start with the enclosed cell for Lancel C or TRA. Could you draw on a problem that doesn't make absolutely quite a difference? Well, the question is whether with a ghost cell to the left we would get the same. Um, well, we could get something similar, but then we would need to have an information on the ghost cell. For example, if we had here, if we had then here something, um, no, I would not say that. Um, well, uh, no, I no, I would not say so. What you can get if you want to get it similar is something different. You would do it then. You can do it the following way, like in finite difference. Actually, you assume that now your values are here, so that this is the x a and this is the x one, and that the control volumes are then here. So this is then the first control volume, and this is the control volume for the boundary, which is only a half step. Then you can get it exactly like final difference. Because then when you do, uh, you don't need to compute here. The TA, the temperature is given. You don't need to compute that. But we need to compute here, and if we have uh, the T1 here, we can do that, and the distance here would be delta x then it would be just like finite difference. So in that way we can just recover finite difference. We would call that, when we would discuss with the finite volume, a node center finite volume method. We would first say we find the node points at wherever we want to have them, and then we would find, we find the faces as the midpoints between them. But what we did was different. We defined first our control volumes, and then we said our midpoints are in the middle of these cells. And then we end up with having a cell next to the boundary. Here we have the cell next to the boundary is only a half cell. And this is a full cell, but it makes that in the end that we get the final difference method in the end. So there are different ways to do it. So for the directly boundary conditions, this way or final difference would be preferable. But when, as we shall see, for the um, normal boundary conditions, the way with the finite volume method, as we discussed it, the cell-centered finite volume method would be advantages. Okay, so what we get by all this in the end is then a system of order differential equations. And uh, as we discussed before, this system of order differential equations will have a right-hand side that might depend on t, but it will not depend on t of the time if the boundary conditions are constant. So that was what we had discussed. So let us just uh, recall that. So that was the 9, and that was the dt. dt is the general case of r of t, t. And that is we get that through the boundary conditions. T A of T and T B of T. So if the boundary conditions, uh, the values are constant, so the T A are constant, bound T A constant and T B constant, they might be different, but they need to just be constant. Then we have dt, dt is equal to r of t. So then we have a system of ordinary differential equations where the right hand side 
is only dependent on the unknown, not on time. In any case, we have reduced the problem, our power differential equation problem, by the finite volume discretization in space to a system of ordinary differential equations, either in this general form or in this form, uh, simplified form if we have constant boundary conditions. Now the next task will be to solve these systems of ordinary differential equations. And then we can use any um, method that we find convenient for doing time integration. So that will be then the next point, that we solve these systems of equations in time. We have now discretized in space, now we solve them also in time. And what we shall do now is just similar to what we discussed for the finite difference method in the course Introduction to Skill. And those, for those of you who have similar courses, you have probably heard also about that, using then the finite difference method and getting, for example, the forward time centered space for the discretization of the heat equation. That's what we are going to do now. So, that brings us then to the explicit point. To simplify the discussion, we shall now assume um, constant boundary conditions, so that we have this form. But it's just a technical thing which is not important to have the general case just for the boundary conditions, but uh, this makes it easy. So we will look at that. So how, we do, how do we do the discretization of, uh, so of then this form here? Well, we use the explicit Euler method, that means we take uh, the discretization right inside at the old time value that we know, and we do a forward difference approximation uh, for the time derivative. So that means we do this discretization, we write the time indices as upper index, index, so that is the new time level, minus the solution at the old time level that we already know, divided by the time step, sum is delta t. And on the right hand side, we take the right hand side at the old time level. That is important. So that will be then the explicit Euler method for solving this equation. If we look at the difference stencil, then we will have the time here, we will have the x location here, and then we have here the midpoint in our case of the cell J to the XJ, here will be the midpoint of the cell XJ minus 1, and here will be the midpoint of the cell J plus 1. Because the data that we need is TJ, TJ minus 1, and TJ plus 1. So that is indicated by this stencil. But what we want, and the, the time level here is n delta t. We have constant time step delta t. And what we want to determine is the value at the time level n plus 1, which is at the time n plus 1 times delta t. So that is what we want to determine. So the unknown depends then on the values at the old time level in the cell J and its left and right name, J minus 1 and J plus 1. So that would be then the difference stencil. So let's then discuss the finite volume method discretized by the explicit Euler method in time. something that uh, we have already done for the finite difference method in the last term introduction to CFD and I hope you have had that in a similar course. 
we find that this method is first order in time. And that means that the error is, uh, that the truncation error is of the order of delta t. And it means then it will, will add something. If it, uh, that means that it's first order in time. And it is also that the method is second order in space. That means that the truncation error is of the order delta x squared. So when we refine the delta x, half the delta x, then we have delta x half to the power 2, that is delta x squared divided by 4. So the spatial error get reduced, gets reduced by a factor of 4 when we half the grid spacing. When we half the time step, the error in time gets reduced by a factor of 2. Order, we have then uh, delta t half will be the, order, the uh, order of the error. So that is what we can say about the accuracy regarding the stability. That will be something that uh, we discuss, we're going to meet, we want, we want you to do in exercise 2, to show that the method is stable for R um, like that, where the R is the following, R is the ratio of the thermal diffusivity times the time step, delta T divided by the grid space in delta X squared. That is sometimes called the, the, the von Neumann number. Not so often seen, but sometimes it is seen in literature. It's a stability parameter, as we see here. So if we have R, the ratio of alpha delta T and delta X squared, in this range, then the method is stable. Okay, so then we can express the explicit Euler method. And Form. That can be then for an interior cell. Of course, at the boundary we have also the, always these special cases because of the grid space in delta x half between the boundary and the midpoint of the first or last cells. So for interior cells, uh, with, let's see, that was what we discussed in the beginning. That was the discretization 11. That was what only R, the right hand side of the system, looks like. And with the approximation in time, 12, uh, well, with this approximation, then 12 becomes, this is the explicit Euler method, becomes the following. That is then equation 13. So then we can multiply by the time step, delta t, and take the tn on the right hand side. So then we get the, if we look at for the cell j, then the value that is the approximation of the cell average in cell j at the new time level, n plus 1 is equal to that value at the old time level n plus and then we have uh, from uh, earlier we have alpha and delta x squared there already on the right hand side and now we have multiplied by delta t so that will appear then here and if you remember for the interior cells we had here the similar discretization as for the final difference method that is to say we have j plus 1 minus 2tj plus tj minus 1. And now we can identify the time level because those are at the old time level. So it means they get the 
subscript n indicating the whole time level n. So, and that is then the discretization. And here we see appearing this von Neumann number that we have just defined. So that is then the R, the von Neumann number that we have here. Alpha delta phi over delta x squared appears naturally here. And that is what um, we can use for j from 2 to nj minus 1. For j equal to 1 and j equal to nj, we have a little difference, a different situation here, but you just look that up. So that means this is modified for j equal 1 and j equal to nj. Modify for j equal to 1 and j equal to nj. Mm -hmm. That we, we have discussed when we did the derivation. Yes? I just have a question about um, the delta t, where it's, it just does uh, not appear on the, like, the t j n. Yes. Even on the front, like the yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry. Yes, there. Well, it is this one. It's this one. Ah, okay. You multiply yeah. by delta t, you bring it over. Okay. There is no delta t there. Okay. Just yeah. only, uh, only the delta t on the r. That's all. Okay. So that is then what you're going to do in exercise two, to do the programming of that, including then also the, the boundary cells. So then you will have to look up at 11 and have them visualization uh, from there. So that is a um, very simple method and as you see in the file it's explicit so you can you have something at the old time level you start with the initial condition at time level zero you have something you can immediately compute everything at the new time level without solving any system. So you don't need to do any find any matrices for that. You could do it, but it would be a waste of time and effort. You can just do the programming as it stands, like we, we did in, in, or we have done in finite difference method. In finite difference method, that would be then the forward time-centered space method, method, FTCS. But here it is a little different because of the boundaries. There is a little difference. Okay. So that is then the full discretization, both in time and space, so that we have then, uh, oops, that we have discussed then here. And now we can also do an implicit method, and then we don't we do not use the explicit but implicit Euler method. We get a method that is more stable. Because this method, the explicit Euler method, is responsible for this limitation of R. So we have to choose, if we have chosen the delta x, this will give us a limit, this one half, this has to be smaller equal one half, this will give us a limit how large we can choose delta t. And you are also asked, you will be asked in exercise 2 to try to violate that. And then you will see what happens. So it's really important that you will see. So then, implicit model method. don't yet know. 
So what does that mean? If we look at the different stencil again, we have here the X, and it turns out that this R will involve the TJ, the TJ minus one, and the TJ plus one. So that means the value that you have here the XJ, you have the XJ uh, minus one. Here we have the xj plus 1. Then to get the value here we have the time. And here we have again the n delta t. Here we'll have the n plus 1 delta t. So what will be involved are the will be the values at the new time value. It will be involved now the value here from nj minus 1 and the value from nj plus 1. They will be involved to get the values at the new time level. And from the old time level, only the value at uh, tj will be involved. So only this one. So the difference then still changes. So this indicates that the solution is now dependent on the values at the new time level in the cell and the left and the right neighbors. So, then we can again now discuss this method. And that is then the final coding method with the implicit element. First order accurate in time, which is the same as before, that is the location error is dependent on delta t. And it is also, like before, second order accurate in space. So there is no difference. First order in time and second order in space. Just the same as the explicit order method. But the difference is stability. This method is unconditionally stable. And that means that it is stable for all delta t greater than zero. Equal to zero wouldn't make sense because the time step zero, uh, well, then we cannot march in time. So we need, but it can be as large as we want. That means it is stable, but it does not mean that it is accurate. So you have to be very careful with that. So when you use that to compute in time, you must be sure, you must check that by some other means, that you are accurate enough in time. If you want to follow a time evolution like we do in, ex we do in exercise two, we will also be, will be necessary to be accurate in time. And then you cannot use the large, very large delta t. Then it is stable, but the accuracy will be really bad. So you have to be careful about that. But the good thing is when you want to get to steady state, then you can use the delta t as large as you want. You can try that. You can use really large numbers, so enormous numbers. Then you can get the, the steady state solution where the time derivative of, the, of t is zero in one time step. So that is really efficient. OK, so that has pros and cons. And regarding the uh, interior cells, then we will get uh, a similar expression as we get for the finite difference method. So, we can get to that. that we have 
break, then the implicit Euler method becomes following, and that is then um, called 15 B. Pjn plus 1. Now we bring everything that is unknown to the left hand side. So what we had before with a plus gets now with a minus on the right hand side with the temperatures at the new time value. That is the difference. Before they were at n, now they are at n plus 1. And on the right hand side we have simply the Tjn. That is j from 2 to nj minus 1. So that is the expression that we get for the interior cells. And at the boundary cells, then, we get uh, the corresponding uh, difference. Let's see if I have that here. Yeah, here we have it. So here we have it for the, the equation that we have just looked at. If you can see that here, if we get here the 1 minus r minus 2, it gives plus 2r for the center. Uh, unknown Tjn plus 1, so we get this expression here. The minus R Tj minus 1, that is coming from this here, minus R Tj minus 1, and the minus R Tj plus 1 is coming from this one, minus R Tj plus 1. So that is the, this uh, row here that we have seen. And similarly, we can get it for the first cell, this one, and for the last cell, where the boundary conditions now enter. And all this that we will discuss then tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll have first, uh, for those who like, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the guidance on exercise one, and then we have the lecture at 10.15 uh, tomorrow here to continue on this. Then we'll see that we will get a triangular linear system of equations. Okay, so let's stop here. So now we have to see how the final volume works for the heat.